And we are back on the zero hour as we continue our coverage of and our uh, reflections, if that's not too passive a word, on the events of uh, this week on Capitol Hill. Uh, I'm Richard R.J. Eskow, your host. Joining us now, uh, my next guest, uh, always appreciate talking to him. He's been uh, a long-term uh, journalist covering events in the Middle East, in, in uh, Syria, in Israel, in Palestine, in Venezuela, in Washington, D.C., and other uh, centers of states that are collapsing under internal conflict, and of course, the latest being Washington, D.C. He was there for the events uh, of this week. Max Blumenthal is an award-winning journalist. He's written a number of books, including The Management of Sav Savagery and Goliath. He's produced several documentaries, including Killing Gaza, and he uh, is co-founder of The Gray Zone, um, which, according to this biography I'm reading now, uh, was founded to shine a journalistic light on America's state of perpetual war and its dangerous domestic repercussions. Now we could argue the events of this week were among those dangerous uh, repercussions, but I don't want to put his words in his mouth. First of all, Max Blumenthal, welcome to the program. Good to be back. Um, very momentous time to come back on. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, since, uh, since you were there, uh, you know, we've heard different versions of firsthand stories about it, but uh, none from someone who, well, none from someone who I, you know, kind of trust perspective wise uh, the way I do you. So tell us what you saw. Yeah, I'll try to tell you what I saw um, with the kind of objective perspective, but I don't, I don't know how I can avoid uh, shooting it through with my own opinions, considering just the reaction 24 hours later that I'm seeing online, which doesn't, I don't know, it seems dissonant to me in a lot of ways. I arrived, uh, well, I live like 15 minutes from Capitol Hill. And I arrived uh, around like two o'clock. They had already, the, had already invaded the Capitol. They'd run up in the Capitol from the rear of the building so the front side of the capitol that faces the national mall was filled with like five to ten thousand people just really rowdy crowd with spurs and everything don jr was there he looked coked up in the video i saw and in the back there was some kind of pandemonium when i arrived all the uh wi-fi the, the cell towers were overwhelmed so wi-fi was knocked out not wi Wi-Fi, um, the cell service was knocked out, so I couldn't live stream this, which was a real disappointment because uh, everything I saw from the moment I got there was feel significant. And uh, I immediately went for the one of the doors in the back of the Capitol to try to get inside to see what was happening. And it was at that point the Capitol Police, who looked extremely uh, agitated, I mean, they were afraid, uh, had, making their way to the door with baton pepper spray pushing people out and a young guy runs out with his hands covered in blood and he's holding his bloody hand up they shot a young woman they shot a young woman um and then everyone starts getting worked up you know screaming at the police i had to make my way down the steps thinking that if i can get clear of this crowd that i could actually post some video of what had just happened because i couldn't get cell service and i see a stretcher coming out the first floor capital of the side they're trying to get the young woman who had been shot out as quickly as possible without any images and i was the first person kind of to get video of it um up close i followed this stretcher to the ambulance as blood was pouring out of this one neck over the ground there are medics pumping and cops pumping her heart trying to keep her alive she i mean her face was like completely blank and then a cop with an assault rifle in kind of like a RoboCop suit pushes me back. This cop was isolated. Um, there was no, there were very few other officers around him. And uh, she was shot apparently by a Capitol police officer. The video showed police officers shooting her in the neck. Uh, 
he tried to climb through a window. She was unarmed. I saw no reason to shoot. Her. Um, and Cohen colleague of mine, he, uh, posted video of it. This just a clear shot. And he was bombarded with comments of people justifying the police killing a woman because ideology, her far right ideology. Mm -hmm. She had come from California and was obviously spurred by this conspiratorial view of the election and everything else. Uh, but she was an Iraq war vet. And a lot of the people that were involved in storming the Capitol, it's, they seemed to be veterans. Um, they seemed to have some kind of military training or they were like into tactical we're totally unafraid. They're unafraid of the cops, unafraid of tear gas or any of the like less lethal weaponry that was starting to be deployed later in the day. And the other reason they were unafraid of the cops is there is a friendly relationship and an open and friendly relationship between the DC police and the Proud Boys. And if you look at video shot at past uh, Proud Boys events where they stormed through DC, you can See them actually having cops, providing them with first aid when other cops aren't around, shaking hands. And I saw police and Proud Boys and other you know, militia-related characters fraternizing all around the Capitol. So that was definitely a factor. I mean, I'm pointing at two factors here in the chaos that took place. There are other ones I want to get to. Number one, the fact that many of these people were veterans or even uh, law enforcement are looking for another mission and they're sort of aimless just wandering around the country and this was a mission they weren't they're were going to climb the fence of the capital and storm in and restore democracy in their view right. second factor being the cops uh expecting nothing like that and expecting to have more sort of a, a engagement with the, with them while they all kind of came together against antifa and black lives matter their shared enemy uh the third factor was that there was no shared enemy there. Black Lives Matter DC told everyone to stay at home. And Biden voters who are freaking out about the Capitol being invaded and who live on Capitol Hill outnumber these Trump masses decided to stay home. And they always come up with an excuse to stay home. I mean, I think many of them enjoy the fact that they have to socially distance and are obsessed with the COVID protocol. But you know, you go to Capitol Hill and see all these signs that say hate has no home here, all these virtue signaling signs, Black Lives Matter. Um, and it's just these are just empty statements. Of course, none of the signs. There are also all these signs with the most banal Martin Luther King quotes, like none of his nothing from the Riverside Baptist Church speech. The, every, it's almost like everybody's lawn has those signs around Capitol Hill. But anyway, hate came home and, and they stayed home. And I actually think that. Biden liberals had known this was happening. They should have formed a human chain around the Capitol or done something to protest and it would have mobilized more police forces to the scene. But the police basically, did, there were just very few police at the Capitol when this began. They completely under, it wasn't just that they underestimated the Trump mob. They didn't really expect to confront them just because they're chanting back the blue. And so I got there, the police had very sparse, uh, their, their gear was not, they were not equipped for a riot. Then they brought in a wave of reserves, they had batons, they didn't even have uh, shields. And I, I went up to the cops, I was kind of taunting them. I was like, why aren't you, where are your shields, where are your, your beanbag rounds, where are your guys, where's everything that you shot at us on June 1st? I mean, I was still out there as a journalist, but I sympathized with the Black Lives Matter protests. Us. So I said, us, on June 1st, you were just shooting us for walking on the street. And I mean, obviously the cops aren't going to say anything back. As the cops march in, they um, are hectored by the MAGA mob. I mean, they're calling them, uh, I, I mean, I can't curse on this show, on this, can I? Right, you can. So I can't even say, I, I can. You they were calling them, they would call the black cops monkeys, like right to their face. They were call them faggots they were calling them traitors chanting fuck the police i mean like a hateful rhetoric fuck the police is something fuck 12 of that i would hear at black lives matter rallies and screaming at cops and the cops would not react it was something i would never seen before because you know if you do that 
at, at a Black Lives Matter rally, they're going to assault you and they will consider it just and they're going to drag you into a police wagon. But they weren't doing that there. Um, and this this created an interesting dynamic, though, because I started to see calls for vengeance and, and, and people uh, giving kind of speeches about the woman who was killed and how there shouldn't be peaceful protest needed to arm up and take the Capitol. And I said to the, I started to approach different, um, I don't want to call them, I don't even know what to call them, protesters or rioters. And I said, you know, do, can you understand why people would protest police brutality in Washington, D.C.? And I actually told a group of like militia men, like guys with beards, with like paramilitary uniform on. I told them about Dion K., who is a young man who lives in the neighborhood over from me who was shot in the back by a DC police officer because he had an illegal handgun and he was running away. And he was shot on camera, actually shot in his chest on camera while throwing the handgun away. And I said, you guys are like Second Amendment rights. Like you are here pr protesting those gun laws in DC. He was shot for that. Can you, un can you sympathize with him? Can you understand why people came out and protested at the police station for, for him? And you know, they didn't get angry at me. It just scrambled their brains. And they started to either come up with excuses for the cop. Oh, well, the cop will be prosecuted. Or maybe it was just a security guard. Or they would just uh, this word salad that made no sense at all and just went into contortions. Or they just like refused to answer the question. Um, one person actually said, well, I can understand Black Lives Matter. And then someone else approached them and shut them down. Basically, you saw this deep-seated indoctrination and um, cultural massacre that's so endemic to right-wingers. We've just been drilled, inculcated with authoritarian ideology um, since the formative period of their lives when they were you know, spanked into submission uh, so that they display respect for any authority figure in uniform. And they couldn't grasp the fact that a cop had just shot one of them unarmed and that they were screaming at the cops and calling them traitors. But then there, were this, there was this other group that they declare their mortal enemies who's going through the same experience. And I said, why can't you get together with them for this shared goal of ending police brutality? And they, I mean, that just was impossible. But that question couldn't be answered. And there were so, so there were so many contradictions. Basically, it all ended around the time that um, Super Mario villain Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, called for a curfew. I just make the joking about her name, but she's a villain of the Black Lives Matter movement in D.C. for her relationship with developers. She's a protege of Mike Bloomberg, um, and you know, and she called a curfew, which was totally unnecessary, just to create a pretext for arresting everybody, including journalists. And uh, uh, around 5 p.m., an hour before the curfew, I was at the front side of the Capitol, and I made my way into the crowd to get as close to the Capitol as possible. And I found a, a pair of cops in the Capitol basement who were basically being held hostage. I mean, I've never hmm. seen anything like this. And they were they were frightened. There was a female cop, and she was basically trying to negotiate her way out with a group of guys who had appointed themselves the sort of um, rebels of the MAGA mob and we're trying to say, there's cops over there, we'll walk you over there. And behind her was a, a guy with a, a cop with a powered rifle and his hand holding his rifle. And they were frightened and they decided to just shut the door and not uh, leave this little like kind of cubby hole in the basement they were stuck in. And when it's later, tear gas and flashbangs started to rain down. It was from what felt like the top of the cap and the crowd was outed in a cloud of noxious tear gas, people running back um, with their eyes filled with tears, and then returning front in like military-like formations. And I saw a guy, like a 30-something guy with a MAGA hat on, you know, a red MAGA hat, start to bark instructions to the crowd, the president has said that it is time for us to go. We've done our job. We in, took a government building. It's the first time in 200 years this has happened. We succeeded, and now it's time to go home. And he was completely ignored. 
uh, Trump basically tried to call back forces, but they would tell me and they began telling me like, this isn't just about Trump. This is more than Trump. So Trump's base has gone beyond him at this point. And that means that this kind of display will continue into the Biden era, in my view. Yeah, and I, I think that's important. Again, we're talking with journalist Max Blumenthal, who was at the um, Capitol Hill um, incident, uh, for lack of a better word. And to me, I mean, a couple thoughts, Max. One is, uh, you know, people are uh, certainly members of Congress horrified at the breach of their sanctum. But it seemed to me, first of all, watching it, watching the video, um, it seemed to me that a number of them w w did seem to have military training, including thinking of one guy who hung off a balcony in camo with, with uh, you know, maybe he had a weapon in one hand, but he could clearly, you know, hang from a great height by one hand and lift himself up and, you know, take pictures and do whatever he needed to do. Uh, if they had chosen, and I had this thought last night too, to come in fully armed and start shooting, it, it seems to me it could have been a massive bloodbath and that it was just sheer luck or something else that there wasn't slaughter like that. In fact, that the only fatalities aside from heart attacks was the woman being uh, shot by the police. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but to me, uh, obviously I'm not condoning what they did, but, but it seems to me striking that they could have caused so much more uh, carnage, to use Trump's words, than they did. I, I don't think that they came armed. Uh, if there were any arms, they were concealed weapons. And that has to do with D.C.'s strict handgun laws mm -hmm. and its enforcement. And the police made an example of um, Enrique Tarrio, the leader of the Proud Boys. They arrested him as soon as he came into the city. Uh, accused him of illegal handgun possession and ripping up Black Lives Matter signs during the last Proud Boys of Stop the Steal event. Um, it was, it, this had taken place in Arizona where they have open carry, a place like that. Um, you would have seen hundreds and hundreds of paramilitary style characters with assault rifles, AR-15s and Bushmasters. And those are very intimidating. Actually, Michigan has open carry, and they made an intimidating display at the beginning of the pandemic against Governor Whitmer. And uh, that didn't take place, but they fought hand-to-hand -hand with Capitol Police, and many of them are trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat or have you know these little fight clubs. They overwhelmed the Capitol Police. And uh, then they pretty much had no plan from there. It was just to take pictures in the Capitol. And, uh, you know, I saw them carry souvenirs out. It was kind of, a, I, I kind of found it, like, I, I have to say I found a little bit of amusement in it because I don't see the Capitol as the people's house. I don't see it as full of democracy. I see it as the lobbyist house. I see it as the financial industry's house. I see it as the war state's house, the Pentagon's house, Big Pharma's house. Um, so I wasn't exactly pining for these symbols, but the ideology that was on display was counter-revolutionary, explicit, fascistic, and uh, pretty much dedicated to crushing any opposition. And it wasn't just Pelosi who was targeted, Democrats. There's this picture of a guy with his foot on Pelosi's desk. And I kind of agree with Jimmy Dore, might have done a better job of, you know, governing than Nancy Pelosi, but that's sort of beside the point. They went at and they tried to break into Mitch McConnell's office. And I think that's when the thing occurred. But, uh, you know, I've heard people say that their dis people on the left say that their disagreement was with the ideology, the fascistic counter-revolutionary authoritarian ideology of these protesters or rioters, I guess it was riot. But the tactic of storming the Capitol was something that uh, is not necessarily undemocratic. And I would agree with that. If the Capitol were stormed with people who were not 
you know, trying to intimidate everyone and we're trying to make a point about health care because we're not going to be getting Medicare for all. I would stand with them. I mean, I'm sorry, but like that that's something I would stand for. And what we're seeing now is it's being used to shut down not just the assault on democracy itself that people who use weapons and muscle to intimidate lawmakers represent, but shut down the very tactic of the people occupying a government building, doing a sit-in, for example, or surrounding the building peacefully and having an occupation, an Occupy style occupation, in order to just shut that down and securitize the capital. There's a problem going around, oh, you know, the government spends $850 billion on the Defense Department to fight wars abroad, but it let, um, you know, these clowns, this guy in a Viking suit, invade the capital. Well, what are the implications of that meme? It's funny and it sounds good. It sounds like a critique of a uh, bloated Pentagon budget, but actually what they're calling for is to hyper-securitize the capital so that right. any engagement, right. any democratic engagement is virtually impossible. And I just went by the Capitol 10 minutes or 10 minutes before the show, 15 minutes before the show. It's completely surrounded in, in fencing and there are national guardsmen and hyper-militarized police all around the lawn. And I typically go in the Capitol, you know, before the pandemic, I would typically go in there and my cell phone or camera, and I'd get in the faces of members of Congress and ask them hard questions about the wars they were waging, regime change operations they were signing off on. And I feel like those days are over. Um, so, you know, I think there are implications that go beyond shutting down the fascistic right here that are extremely dangerous for a movement, a people's movement. And you know, that's actually a great point, Max Blumenthal, and, and it gets into, and first of all, I have to say, you know, one of the reactions I had last night on social media and personally was, I was getting irritated at people pejoratively calling it an insurrection because that word to me has, describes many positive as well as, you know, disturbing events in history and insurrections against unjust authority have been, you know, a great part of uh, human tradition, you know. So I would have preferred not to see the word insurrection applied in this case, um, but that's just personal reaction. Uh, I, but it gets into the question of, first of all, you have a kind of, you know, there's this entire critique of the Democratic Party that I've echoed and, you know, Thomas Frank has written about, you've talked about the, that, you know, it's become the party of the professional managerial class and that there's going to be the, the instinct to say, well, we need to restore the symbols of democracy with, without much attention to actual democracy. And that, you know, that part of, uh, the critique is correct. You know, I mean, it's not responsive. We don't have a government, you know, I mean, we have the Princeton study and other things that show that the federal government is not responsive to public desires and public needs. It's it's much more responsive uh, to oligarchical needs. So, um, but then you get into the question of uh, what this says about the future, right? Because these people who think this way and act this way may not be a large percentage of the population, but you've been in a lot of civil war zones. And, uh, you know, my understanding is it doesn't take a large percentage of the population to destabilize a society, number one. And number two, an effective response is uh, you just described, you know, what I fear may very well be the permanent response which is, you know, what access we've had will be further restricted, whatever democratic feedback channels have been there, uh, however pale, you know, compared to what they should be, should, will be shut down. And uh, number two, we'll devote all sorts of resources to symbols and not give any thought to political or economic or social democracy. But I mean, that's a mouthful. But I mean, I guess my question is, um, you know, did you have any thoughts on where you saw this going? No, I agree with everything you just said. And if you look at what's taking place today, what the 
Democrats responses and the members of the squad who were kind of exposed by Jimmy Dore for their refusal to challenge Nancy Pelosi on Medicare for all and force a vote, at least to force everyone to identify where they stood on this dire need of health care and, of, and of vote for Pelosi, basically roll over, is that they're calling for the invocation of the 25th Amendment, the removal of Trump and the removal of the senators who challenged the electoral college. And they're getting, I mean, the squad in particular is getting drawn away from the social democratic ideals that they were supposed to represent and drawn into the theater that the Democratic Party has created in the Trump era of impeachment 10 days before Trump has to leave office. Um, th this is going to justify their complete abandonment of the campaign promises they made, particularly Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who kind of ran on Medicare for all, on abolishing ICE, and even proposed being a one-term member of Congress to disrupt business as usual. Actually, she justified her vote for Pelosi on the basis of the impending right-wing uh, march on Washington and the need to unify days ahead. I was actually just listening to in my own, uh, in a fit of masochism, Pod Save America. And it's pretty beneficial to listen to them because you have the ear of the Democratic Party and they speak for it. Um, and in a lot of ways, they influence it as well. There are these 30 sure. and 40 sing former Obama staffers who are just like the, the, the embodiment of the kind of managerial class that you mentioned that Tom Frank always talks about. And they were talking about the agenda they wanted to see for the uh, Democratic Congress that could could this was this was on day. So the special election results uh, were just coming in and they were expecting that the Democrats would control the Senate narrowly, the Democrats have the House. And so talking about the agenda, they didn't use the word healthcare once. Medicare for all was not part of their agenda. Um, reducing the Pentagon budget, not, not part of their agenda. Uh, college, eliminating college debt, debt for college students who took out loans, not on their agenda. All they were talking about was reform and anti-corruption moves and prosecuting Trump out of office. So all of these symbolic moves and what they consider um, legislation to improve democracy in this abstract form, which is taking place today with all of the talk of the 25th Amendment in order to save the republic from these um, authoritarians. And it's such an elite discussion that doesn't relate to any real material needs of the American public that they are simply creating the context for this to continue happening. Then there's social media censor. Trump was kicked off Facebook, to, which creates, it, it drives momentum for censoring more, uh, you know, anti-establishment voices on the left or simply arbitrarily censoring anyone who falls afoul of the security state. Then, and, there is, um, where was I? There is the, oh, I totally lost my train of thought, but there was one. Other no, that's okay, Max, because, because uh, I'll jump in on a couple things. Max Blumenthal, one is, uh, uh, as always, I had never wavered from this, that when liberals, Democrats start talking about, about it, it, take this but... turn of, of uh, we want, the the networks of communication, Facebook and Twitter and so on, to absolutely censor people whose views we find objectionable. They are the, the midwives of dystopia, which is a good title for something. Actually, I should use that. But um, so it's it's extremely disturbing to me. Number one, number two, you mentioned Jimmy Dore and force the vote and all that. I don't know how much time you got. I got a lot of opinions about that, but I've known Jimmy for 15 years. I consider him a friend. The um, I could craft arguments on both sides of that force the vote thing. What was astonishing to me was that the squad side never crafted, as far as I could tell, a plausible argument. It was another argument from authority. Well, we know what we're doing. And 
that to me was replicating what the Democratic Party's been doing it to its left for 30 years. So aside from the merits of voting for Pelosi, not voting for Pelosi, maybe they were thinking of Paygo versus Medicare. For, I don't know. They didn't say. But it seemed to me that what we had was when we were talking about Medicare for all, which will save hundreds of thousands of lives, the answer was, well, but what do you think of Jimmy Dore? That's insane. So I had to get that in there. But um, uh, anyway, I don't know how much time you got left, but uh, we could go a couple more minutes. Uh, any concluding thoughts? I have one more question for you after this, but any concluding yeah. thoughts on uh, Capitol Hill? Well, I'll try to keep it short because I just you know picked up on my train of thought thanks to what you just said. And sure. I would like to make a, a comment take on your time. the force to vote. Yeah, take your time. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I was like, I, I could barely sleep tonight. I was so overstimulated by what I saw yesterday. It was just this amazing George Romero like zombie theater of the absurd. But uh, I also wanted to say that eliminating the electoral college and making the voting system itself more transparent. I've been an observer to two elections in the last several months in Bolivia and Venezuela. Venezuela's election was just ridiculously denounced as a fraud by the US government. Um, these are transparent election systems and we do not have the ability to actually see how each precinct or voting table voted like we do in those countries and the parties don't get the voting data themselves. And so the specter of a stolen election was easy to create or the hologram of one was easy to create and the electoral college is such an absolute undemocratic joke. But there, so what I, my, the point I was making is the Democrats, their agenda is sort of on the table and it's sort of about entrenching control, consolidating control over the, the, um, the, the discourse, the media and the legislative agenda. I mean, I even saw Jamie Raskin propose, he's a constitutional law, lawyer who's serving as a Democrat in Congress, vetting commission of experts, including figures from the national security state to vet presidential candidates and nominees fitness for office. So it's sort of this, they're trying to impose this technocracy without answering the material needs of the American public or addressing the flaws in our voting system and creating the context for this to continue happening. On force to vote, I think it succeeded. A lot of people say it failed. It succeeded. It succeeded in exposing the as a diversity washing project to sheepdog young people and millennials back in to the Democratic Party that fails them and refuses to address their material needs, especially on debt. And so they're not going to deliver. They're just not. I can just see it. And I'm just willing to say that it was so positive for Jimmy to do that and expose them. And what they represent is these, the Obama model of politics. They're obviously more progressive than Obama, but it's the same project of sheepdogging. Um, and it's time for something else. It's time for something more grassroots and original. I think Jimmy brought that to the table with Force the Vote. So to me, it was a success. And, uh, yeah, yeah and you have any to me, you know, you know, people say, well, Jimmy's rude. Well, he's rude to me and we're, fr you know, he's a rude guy. He's, we're friends, but he's rude. The, it doesn't matter, you know. And to me, one of the lessons of the Force the Vote was that it constantly has to be renewed is that the cults of personality have no place in politics. So I'm always quoting yes. Ella Baker, yes. who said, strong people don't need strong leaders. We're still looking toward, uh, you know, the like uh, when we were kids, the baseball cards with, you know, Tom Seaver on them or whatever. We're, we're, we want AOC to be Tom Seaver or, you know, no, stop collecting baseball cards and go out there and play the game yourself. You know, that's or Fauci. The worship of Fauci is so repulsive to me. He's admitted to lying twice this year because he can get away with it because he's so worshipped that he actually admits that he manipulated the public through telling falsehoods. And that's that should be considered unacceptable. But when I try to even make that point in the presence of liberal Democrats, they just they think I'm like a Trumper. They think I'm just lying. Um, and where this comes from is the, the, the acceptance of the fact that the Democratic Party is not going to ch change the material conditions of their constituency. So they create cults of personality. 
and try to sort of live vicariously through them or cheer for the fact that Ilhan Omar is able to wear her blue hijab in Congress. And that is considered the progress that they're voting for rather than actually getting something for their government. And their politics essentially consists of worshiping these figures and virtue signaling. I'll probably get a accused of echoing a right-wing trope for using that term virtue signaling, but putting a Black Lives Matter placard on your front lawn or you know, everybody's welcome here, hate has no home here, and just showing how nice you are while you stay at home and right-wing mobs besiege the Capitol and interfere with the process that you so revere. So that whole model has to be interrupted. That whole culture has to be interrupted. And Jimmy, with his anger, I mean, he's not solely responsible for it, but his anger is really channeling anger that you feel and that probably, RJ, I mean, you've been, you've been around the block enough. You get out into the low rent suburbs or you go to one of the smaller cities in like Illinois and people are pissed off. They're disgusted with the two party system and they're, they're not, they don't care about yeah. the squad. They want stuff. They want stuff from their government and they're going to overdose on fentanyl if they don't get it. Yeah, Pissed. which is one that those overdoses come a little close to home in my family, unfortunately. But yes. So, um, Max, if you got a minute before you go, um, do you, you have I, another I minute have or minute two before I go? Yes. OK, because originally we were going to talk about Julian Assange and um, when we when we scheduled you and it is still important it is as important as ever. And um, as you know, was well, uh, the judge uh, in Great Britain ruled that uh, the Julian Assange could not, wouldn't be extradited to the United States because although she accepted all the national security state's arguments about him, uh, she said he would be subject to supermax level torture conditions and was in a fragile uh, psychological state. And it would amount to torture. So she did not. And then she kept him in those conditions in Belmarsh prison, as I understand it, because she refused his uh, extradition, uh, his bail request uh, a couple of days later. So I, I just want to reiterate, uh, because I think a lot of our audience um, and certainly a lot of people in this country uh, think uh, have misconceptions about Assange. Um, and in a way, you know, there's kind of a parallel with in a, in a crazy way, I mean, a much bigger scale with Jimmy Dore and that they want to talk about whether they like him or don't like him. They don't want to talk about, first of all, you don't know him. So, you know, how do you know? Uh, but secondly, um, it's what he represents. So, I mean, my feeling on this is clear. If, uh, if Julian Assange is not a publisher and a journalist, then, you know, Peter Zanger, you know, the original broadsheet publisher in the United States, considered the heroic founder of American journalism, wasn't, a, wasn't in journalism either. So, I mean, he published, he edited, he, um, you know, I think there's a lot of misconceptions, but you tell me that a lot of misconceptions that he put out, you know, things that got people killed and that sort of thing. But I think that the idea that, uh, that he should continue to be tortured after all these years and imprisoned for doing journalism is uh, grotesque, monstrous, and is something that endangers all of us. Um, but what are your thoughts? No, I agree. And he has Julian Assange in the target character assassination as a pretext to uh, by CIA contractors to carry out a state assassination. I, I revealed these um, testimonies by former workers of the UC Global security firm that was contracted by the CIA to spy on Julian Assange while he was holed up taking sanctuary in the Ecuadorian embassy in London because of phony charges against him uh, that were later counted for rape and jumping bail. And so basically the only charge against him technically was jumping bail, but he knew there was a secret indictment and there was the secret indictment was uh, 
violating the Espionage Act for publishing classified information, the State Department cables that, and and the digital murder video, Reuters stringers and journalists in Iraq being murdered by U.S. helicopter ships, publishing that, uh, which he got from the, uh, from Chelsea Manning. So Julian Assange has been effectively a prisoner since uh, he took shelter, I think, in um, like a decade ago in the Ecuadorian embassy. And not a decade ago, it was like five years ago. But uh, now, now he's in prison in London in a maximum security prison because the U.S. is seeking to extradite him after he was arrested there. The British security is essentially one hand with the U.S. security state. And in a very bizarre and Mark ruling, judge ruled that while he could not be extradited because the U.S. prison system is simply too draconian and he is a legitimate suicide risk and he was even found with a razor blade in prison, uh, the U.S. was correct to spy on him, to prosecute him for uh, supposedly violating the Espionage Act. He's like the first journalist to be put on trial for the or to be prosecuted for violating the Espionage Act. And that uh, he should also be denied bail. So what this judge is seeking to do is prevent Julian Assange from speaking to the public, number one, by denying him bail, contradicting herself about his suicide risk, because I to see how a COVID-infested maximum security prison in London is any more hospitable than a supermax prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, or Florence, Colorado. They're certainly absolutely horrible and cruel and unusual punishment. And she she is do she's acting out an extension what she's doing is an extension of the CIA's campaign against Julian Assange as articulated by former CIA director Mike Pompeo in April 17 which is to destroy disrupt WikiLeaks and so by keeping him in prison psychologically tormenting him the co-founder and sort of spiritual and intellectual leader of WikiLeaks they are seeking to incapacitate this website, which really functioned as an intelligence agency for the people of the globe, providing them with access and uh, to documents that really show how the sausage is made, particularly in Washington. Um, but w anything can show up on WikiLeaks through its secure drop mechanism from a whistleblower. They've revealed uh, how the Russian security state works as well and provided transparency to repressive mechanisms that state mechanisms that violate the law and rely on secrecy to manufacture content. And that's where Assange's danger lies. So he is being prosecuted for precisely that. And Julian Assange and WikiLeaks enjoyed partnerships with the New York Times, the Washington Post, right. Le Monde, newspapers around the world to report on these classified documents. They tried to be responsible about it. They tried to, you know, um, d redact the names of, for example, Afghan collaborated with Afghan citizens who collaborated with the U.S. occupation authority so they wouldn't be killed by the Taliban by working with the papers. And they got thrown under the bus by the whole media. Juli the New York Times and Washington Post both endorsed Julian Assange's arrest. And it's only recently that some mainstream Figures from the press have come forward and said, if he goes to jail and gets extradited and prosecuted and sent to jail for 175 years under the Espionage Act, what well, anyone can, that's absolutely correct, including me or you, if you publish classified documents, talk about right. them. Right. So, and to me, that's the other decision. purpose. Yeah. And to me, that's the other purpose yes. of the persecution is to discourage others not just to paralyze WikiLeaks, but to discourage and frighten anyone else who might think they should, they want to do this to make the world a better and more transparent place. Well, yeah, is, do you want to go, do you want to endure 20 years of torture? I think that, isn't that a part, purpose behind all this too? Yes, yes, yes. It's like, uh, it, it, it's it's like uh, the burning of Joan of Arc. It's, mid, it's medieval style punishment where the police or authorities were unable to comprehensively crack down on crime, so they'd make examples of criminal public square by subjecting 
subjecting them to just extremely cruel executions to create an atmosphere of fear. And that's what Julian Assange is. He's being burned at stake in front of the world of journalism. And you know, of course, all the access journalists. I reported on this. You have like access journalists who depend on the US intelligence agencies and you know spook officials for so many of the stories they write. Whenever they say US officials say this about Russian hacking, so I spoke to three US officials and according to them, Russia's hacked into uh, Epcot Center in Florida and uh, you know, Mickey Mouse is a muck. Like they, they went there, these, these national security correspondents would actually sometimes interview Julian Assange when he was in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. I'm thinking of one in particular, Ellen Nakashima, who is the Washington Post chief national security correspondent. And when she entered, she didn't know it, but the CIA contractor, simply posing as embassy security, opened her phone, hacked, potentially hacked into her phone, opened her devices, went into her notes, took photos of them, and then sent them back to Langley, apparently. And this all came out in a Spanish case with a contractor the, the, who ran the firm, the CEO of this firm, UC Global, actually was arrested in Spain, charged with violation of Assange's uh, attorney-client privilege, uh, fraud, bribery. He was bribing embassy officials. And as I said before, he had proposed assassinating Assange by poisoning him. But the, he was also invading the devices of journalists from a who's who of mainstream publications, anyone who went to visit Assange. And so I published photos of Nakashima's phone open by this CIA contractor. And I tried to interview her about it. I tried to reach out to her. I spoke to uh, WikiLeaks lawyers who said that she sort of refused to participate in the case. And I just had to ask the question, you know, why? Shouldn't this have been a giant scandal that the CIA was spying on US journalists and hacking into their devices? You know, if Putin or the Russian FSB had done this, it would have been front page news, New York Times. But the journalists themselves are keeping this quiet. There's a code of omerta to not speak about the CIA spying. They depend so much on the good graces of the CIA to do their work as good little security state stenographers. So the has revealed so much about how national security journalism works in the U.S. and how it's so it's really no longer about challenging power in countries. It's more about serving as a force multiplier for the Pentagon or the CIA and antagonizing the official enemies of the U.S. from Venezuela to Iran to China to Russia. I'm still parsing a sentence, an opening sentence I read in the Los Angeles Times the other day, which was, if I remember it correctly, intelligence officials have confirmed that Russia probably hacked dot, 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 and I just was trying to parse confirmed and probably th that you can say intelligence officials stated that it probably uh, hacked. You can say they confirmed if they believe they have evidence that they hacked, but to confirm they probably, you can say you confirmed you believe they probably hacked, but how can you confirm a probability? Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, to me, that's just reflective of of the stenography you're describing. Maybe I'm off base, but I just, I've been puzzling about that from an editorial as well as a logical perspective ever since. This is the solar winds hack, which was said to be an act right. of war right. by um, like a number of democratic senators said this is an act of war. I mean, nobody cares about it. Out, I mean, you talk to anyone about the solar winds hack, they don't feel like they were, it, they, they don't think that Pearl Harbor was just attacked or the towers came down. But it's, it was another convenient time shot of the system that felt designed to provide this continuum between the Russia history of the Trump era into the Biden era to pin Biden down and box him into a really hardline anti-Russian position, um, which he probably was going to take anyway. But Biden on, on policy, as hawkish as he's been, is someone who's demonstrated some degree of independence at times. And I think the it, it, whether or not this hack was committed by Russia, the 
that it was reported on, the way the media dutifully reported it immediately without any skepticism and never, never demanded evidence was designed, was clearly designed to put Biden in a box on Russia. And where's the evidence? We've never gotten the evidence. All we get is U.S. officials. We don't even get to see how the attribution to Russia was made by either any of these security firms or um, intelligence services. We're just supposed to take them at their word. And that's the way this whole Russiagate saga has proceeded. The public has never been given evidence. And here we are four years later advancing our nuclear arsenal, which should be, we should be engaging negotiations with Russia to reduce nuclear weapons, increasing the Pentagon budget and shredding treaty after treaty to the point where there are only a few um, missile treaties left with Russia. It's, I think this poses as much of a threat to humanity or it poses far more of a threat to the survival of humanity than the coronavirus pandemic and actually makes it harder to resolve the pandemic because cooperation with Russia for vaccines is becoming in itself another geopolitical competition. So, of course, of course. So the, and, and unfortunately, media, we're going to have to leave. Say, yeah. Close by saying the yeah. media is responsible for this more than anyone. Without the media, the complicity and the, the enthusiastic role the media played in this, none of this hostility would have been possible. The corporate U.S. media. Okay. And unfortunately, we have to leave it there, but I can confirm that this was probably an excellent discussion. And um, as always, Max Blumenthal, appreciate your great reporting, your great work, and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks as always, RJ. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard RJ Escow, and you're listening to The Zero Hour.